Hello, everyone. I'm Kenshin. Welcome to, Talking History. Please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Also, don't forget to turn on the notification bell. Thank you. Today's historical discussion is about John Amory, a British traitor during World War II. As countries worldwide uncover domestic spies for the Communist Party in Russia, I want to remind everyone that during times of war, including political parties, media, and organizations, anyone could unexpectedly become reactionary or even traitorous agitators. Today, I'll discuss John Amory, a nearly forgotten British traitor during World War II. Let's start with his background. He was born on March 14, 1912, in Chelsea, London, the eldest son of British politician Leo Amory. His grandfather was an official in the Indian Forestry Commission, and his father served as a member of parliament and later became the first baron of the Admiralty from 1922 to 1924. He defended funding for the Singapore naval base against parliamentary attacks from the Liberal and Labour parties. His younger brother, Julian, later became an MP and served in the Conservative government, indicating a family tradition in politics. However, John wasn't a conventional child. After driving away many private tutors, he attended the prestigious Harrow School, just like his father, who was also a contemporary of Winston Churchill. Despite excelling in gymnastics and winning numerous awards and scholarships, John left school after just one year. Even the headmaster described him as, undoubtedly the most difficult boy I have ever tried to manage. Perhaps overshadowed by his father's legacy, like many children of great fathers, he chose a path outside of politics to prove his worth. Initially, he ventured into the film industry to carve out his own path. However, after several failed attempts, including establishing multiple independent companies that led to near bankruptcy, his ventures turned disastrous. At the age of 21, he married Una Wing, a former prostitute, due to financial troubles from bankruptcy, often relying on his father for financial support. Despite being influenced by his father as a staunch anti-communist, he unexpectedly embraced German National Socialism, seeing it as the only alternative to Bolshevism. After his bankruptcy declaration in 1936, he permanently moved to France, where he met French fascist leader Jacques Doriot in Paris. Together, they traveled to Austria, Italy, and Germany, witnessing the extent of fascism's influence in these countries. In a letter to his family, he claimed to have joined the nationalist faction led by Francisco Franco during the Spanish Civil War in 1936. He also falsely claimed to have received a Medal of Honor while serving as an intelligence officer in the Italian Volunteer Forces, actually working for Franco and maintaining contacts with French fascist organizations. After the Spanish Civil War, he returned to France and settled there. With the outbreak of World War II, he initially chose to stay in France, familiar with German socialism. However, his personality clashed with the Vichy regime, and despite several unsuccessful attempts to leave, he was unable to depart occupied France. A turning point came in September 1942 when Hauptmann Werner Plack facilitated his travel permit to Germany. In October, he traveled to Berlin for discussions with the German-English Committee, where he proposed the formation of a British anti-Bolshevik legion. This impressed Adolf Hitler, who allowed him to stay in Germany as a guest. During this time, he recorded a series of pro-German radio broadcasts, attempting to persuade the British people to join the war against communism. In January 1943, during his visit to France, he encountered Jacques Doriot, a member of the LVF, Légion des Volontaires Français, a French volunteer force fighting alongside Germans on the Eastern Front. Seeing a diminishing willingness of the British Army to combat communism, he perceived it as an opportunity to initiate persuasions for British Nazi cooperation. How did he proceed? Initially, he recruited 50 to 100 men for propaganda and established a core organization to attract more British prisoners of war to join. He even proposed to the Armistice Commission that this unit could provide more recruits than other foreign-led military units. He initiated the first recruitment drive for the British Legion of St. George, arranging a visit to the St. Denis POW camp near Paris. 
he delivered speeches to 40 to 50 inmates from Commonwealth countries, distributed recruitment pamphlets, but the first attempt failed. However, he persisted. During the recruitment process, two men showed interest, including Kenneth Berry, who later joined the BFC. The first batch of recruits in August 1943 came from a group of prisoners of war and Germans in a holiday camp near Berlin. However, by October, his affiliation with this unit ceased as the Waffen SS deemed his services unnecessary, renaming the unit the British Free Corps. In February 1944, the unit relocated to Hildesheim near Hanover and disbanded on April 20, 1944, Hitler's 55th birthday. Historian Adrian Wheel confirmed that 54 men had been part of this unit, some only for a few days, but it never exceeded 27 members at any time. After being ousted by the Waffen SS, he continued broadcasting and writing propaganda in Berlin. By late 1944, he traveled to support Benito Mussolini's Salo Republic in northern Italy. However, on April 25, 1945, he and his French mistress, Michelle Thomas, were captured by Italian partisans near Como. Initially facing execution, they were eventually handed over to Allied authorities and detained. He was wearing the uniform of a quasi-military fascist organization, and the British officer who detained him was Captain Alan Wicker. Upon being repatriated to his homeland, England, he faced trial in London for charges of treason. During the preliminary hearing, he argued that he had never attacked Britain and professed to be staunchly anti-communist, not a Nazi. While the former statement held truth, the latter, though he hadn't joined the Nazis, his actions mirrored theirs. Meanwhile, his brother Julian attempted to prove that his acquisition of Spanish citizenship rendered him legally incapable of committing treason against Britain. Even defense lawyer Gerald Osborne Slade K.C., also a judge, endeavored to establish the defendant's mental instability, suggesting his rationality was doubted by his father Leo, yet all efforts to persuade the court to consider his mental state failed. On the first day of trial, November 28, 1945, to everyone's surprise, he abruptly abandoned further defense attempts and confessed to eight counts of treason. He was swiftly sentenced to death, with the trial lasting a mere eight minutes, making it the shortest recorded trial in British history. Before accepting his plea, Judge Humphreys confirmed that he understood the only permissible punishment was hanging. Convinced of his full comprehension, the judge pronounced, John Amory. I am satisfied that you knew what you were doing, and even after receiving the warnings of your fellow countrymen that the course you were pursuing amounted to treason, you deliberately persisted in it. They called you a traitor, you heard it, but nonetheless, you persisted. Now you have acknowledged yourself a traitor to king and country, and you have forfeited the right to live. On December 19, 1945, he was hanged by executioner Albert Pierpoint at Wandsworth London Borough Prison. Known for executing 400,600 criminals, including 200 war criminals post-World War II, Pierpoint described him as the bravest man I ever hanged in his autobiography. When brought to the gallows, Amory jestingly remarked, I have always wanted to meet you, Mr. Pierpoint, even if not in these circumstances. He was buried in the prison cemetery. In 1996, his brother Julian exhumed his remains for cremation, scattering the ashes in France. His father's epitaph read, at the end of a wayward life, he found a cause, this was not his country's, time alone will prove whether contempt for our ancient laws was treason or foresight. He sleeps well. In contemporary times, facing ongoing conflicts like the Russia-Ukraine war, Middle East tensions between Israel and Iran, and potential conflicts initiated by China in Taiwan and the South China Sea, global military threats are increasing. Besides considering strategies for defense, attention must be paid to how spies conduct internal sabotage and attempt to undermine national defenses. Perhaps stripping these potential traitors of their citizenship could be a measure to consider.